Are you a brand new podcaster, hoping to share what you're passionate about to whoever's willing to listen, but you aren't sure where to start? Navigating the logistics of your podcast can be confusing, from tracking growth to getting your podcast on the biggest platforms like Apple and Spotify. That's why I use Captivate. Captivate is a podcast publishing site that's user-friendly and offers everything you need to fulfill your podcast's full potential. They'll help you publish your podcast to all of the most popular platforms, as well as help you track your growth through daily, weekly, 28, and 90-day download numbers, as well as the averages, so you can see where your podcast might be flourishing or floundering. What's more, they'll help you with promotion and advertising, they offer free courses on how to start and run the perfect podcast, and they even throw in a free website with your subscription, completely customizable to fit your podcast's personality. You can sign up now starting at $19 a month, and you'll even get a free 7-day trial so you can decide whether or not it's right for you. Sign up today at thezoologist.net slash Captivate, and what's more, you'll be supporting my show. Captivate truly is a podcaster's best friend. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Zoologist Podcast. I'm your host, Jake, and today we'll be learning more about some of the amazing creatures that inhabit our planet. Let's get ready to get wild. Today, we'll be exploring the depths of the ocean blue. We all know about the diversity of life that exists near the surface, from sharks and whales to dolphins and coral reefs. But most of the ocean is deep, cold, and in permanent darkness. Yet, despite some of the harshest conditions on Earth, life not only exists, but thrives in these murky depths. Today, we'll be exploring how they do it, as well as some examples of the deep sea's creepiest and coolest denizens. Let's dive in. Hello everyone, hope you're having a great start to your week, and I hope you all had a happy Easter weekend. Easter is a fun holiday, I always feel like I end up eating more candy around Easter than I do even around Halloween. Uh, I always hit this weird kind of, I don't really know how to describe it, this kind of weird state where I haven't eaten enough candy, but I've also eaten too much candy. And so my body's almost at war with itself, like I want to have more candy, but... My body also is telling me to reject all candy that's put before it. Usually, it doesn't end well for me, no matter what I end up deciding to do. In any case, today I'm still dealing with a post-Easter candy headache, so that's fun. Anyway, today's episode is about life in the deep sea, a topic that has fascinated me for years now. I've always been in awe of the the mystery of the deep sea. The truth is, is that we know very little about what goes on down there. We've made strides as technology has improved, but consider the fact that humanity still knows more about the surfaces of the moon and Mars than it does about the bottom of the ocean. According to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, it's estimated that 91% of ocean species have yet to be classified. So while we are gaining more and more knowledge as time moves forward, uh, we still are woefully uninformed about the deep sea and the ecosystems that it holds. What we do know is really, really cool. The animals that live down there are amazing examples of the adaptability and the resiliency of life on Earth because as far as environments go, it doesn't get much harsher and doesn't get much tougher than living in the deep sea. Before I talk about that, though, I do want to define what I mean when I say deep sea, because I'm going to use that term a lot today, and although it sounds like a really general term, there's a certain depth that you have to hit in the ocean before it's really considered the deep sea. Oceanographers divide the majority of the open ocean, or the pelagic zone, into five different areas. The top layer is called the epipelagic zone, also known by its easier to remember name, the sunlight zone. This sunlight zone extends from the ocean's surface all the way down to a depth of about 650 feet, or 200 meters for all you metric system users out there. This is where most of the ocean life that we're familiar with dwells. Dolphins, whales, seals, other aquatic mammals spend most of their time in this part of the ocean. This is also where you're most likely to find fish that are familiar to us, such as the great white shark and tuna. Not all of these animals are exclusive to the sunlight zone, but it is where they will spend the majority of their lives. In this part of the ocean, you're also still getting enough sunlight for photosynthesis to occur. As you go deeper, the less sunlight filters through, and it gets to the point where photosynthesis is no longer possible. 
Once you hit this point, you've reached the end of the sunlight zone at about 650 feet, and this is where the mesopelagic zone begins, otherwise known as the twilight zone, which is both an awesome and a terrifying name for any part of the ocean. Also, whenever I hear the twilight zone of the ocean, I just imagine Rod Serling down there narrating everything that's going on. Uh, everything from this zone down is officially considered deep sea. Uh, the twilight zone specifically descends all the way down to about 3,300 feet or 1,000 meters. It still receives sunlight, but it's very faint, and so as I said before, nothing here can photosynthesize. Despite this, however, there's a thriving, diverse ecosystem in this part of the ocean. In fact, 90% of the world's fish by weight can be found in the twilight zone. There's even one family of fish, a group of species called the bristle mouths, that are native to the twilight zone. And it's estimated that there are a quadrillion of them. I swear that's a real number. I think it's a real number. It probably won't surprise you to hear that they are the most numerous family of vertebrates in the world. As you go deeper, you eventually reach the bathypelagic zone, also known as the midnight zone. This extends from about 3,300 feet deep to about 13,100 feet, or 4,000 meters. At this point, no outside light is visible. It's dark, and it's very cold. It averages about 39 degrees Fahrenheit, or 4 degrees Celsius. The deeper you go into the ocean, the more water pressure becomes an issue as well, as the weight of all that water above you starts to accumulate. In the midnight zone, the pressure is about 110 times what you're getting at the surface. This is also where you reach the average depth of the ocean at about 12,000 feet, or around 3,600 meters. Once you get past the midnight zone, starting about 13,100 feet, you reach the abyssopelagic zone, or the abyss, which extends all the way down to 19,700 feet, or about 6,000 meters. Here the water pressure gets a lot worse. It's about 600 times more than you would experience at the surface. Below the abyss is the hadopelagic zone. Most of this zone consists of ocean trenches, and it goes all the way down to the deepest point in the deep blue sea, Challenger Deep. At the bottom of the Mariana Trench, a depth of 36,070 feet, or 10,994 meters. Just for context, that is 6,600 feet deeper than Mount Everest is tall. Even in this zone, you can still find life, although not much is known about the animals in this part of the ocean, just because of how difficult it is to reach. Uh, consider that more people have been to the moon than to the hadopelagic zone of the ocean, and every time an expedition is sent down there, something new comes up, figuratively, although probably literally as well. For example, in 2018, scientists officially described a snailfish found at 27,000 feet below the surface, the deepest a fish has ever been found, and I believe it's the deepest that any vertebrate has ever been found. So those are the five zones of the open ocean. We'll talk about habitats on the ocean floor a little bit later. Uh, the animals that dwell in those last four zones, the ones considered to be part of the deep sea, they face several unique challenges and environmental factors that most animals don't have to face. It's why life down there has adapted and evolved in some bizarre ways. The search for food alone, for example, has forced these animals to adapt in some really strange ways. Uh, because photosynthesis doesn't exist below 650 feet, food is generally scarce in the deep sea. It's quite difficult to come by, and because of this, animal life has had to get really creative when it comes to getting the nutrition that they need to survive. At least some of the food chain relies on something called marine snow. And what marine snow is, is just organic material, organic matter, that originates at the top and middle layers of the ocean, and then it will drift down towards the seafloor. It gets its name because as it's falling, it looks like falling snow. Some animals in the deep sea, such as the vampire squid, rely almost entirely upon this organic material for their food source. However, the problem is, is that as it falls, more and more of it is getting consumed, so the farther down you go, the less reliable of a food source this becomes, at least for larger animals. Uh, by the time it reaches the bottom, there's still a lot left. One resource I saw said that 815 million tons reach the bottom of the ocean annually, but it's still not enough to completely make up for the deficiency of food. So this is where animals start to get really innovative. Some animals, like the fangtooth, have evolved huge mouths with big, sharp teeth. Anything they catch is probably not getting away. One recently discovered species of acorn worm has extremely long lips, quote-unquote, 
to help it catch its food. Uh, one of the more terrifying examples is the goblin shark. Now, if you've never seen a picture of a goblin shark, Google it at your own risk because it is the stuff of nightmares. They live at depths of anywhere between 300 feet and 4,200 feet, although it seems like they prefer deeper waters and only come closer to the surface at night. These sharks have the ability to literally shoot their jaw out of their mouth to catch their prey, uh, shoot their jaw away from their skull, and they use a double set of ligaments to pull this off. Fortunately, the odds that you're ever going to come across a goblin shark are very slim, but just knowing that, I think, is going to be enough to give a few people nightmares. The Phronema is another deep sea animal that's adapted to find food in a terrifying way. Uh, Phronema are small deep sea crustaceans, and they feed on a kind of zooplankton called a salp. And salps are transparent, barrel-shaped. Uh, some of them look kind of like jellyfish, just without the tentacles, and they can be found all over the ocean. Uh, what Phronema do is they eat these salps, but they don't just eat them. Uh, they actually eat their insides, kind of hollow them out, and then they ride around the ocean in their empty husks. Uh, females will even lay their eggs inside of the husk of salps that they've eaten. The thing is, is that there's no discernible benefit to traveling around inside of this husk, so scientists are baffled as to why they do it in the first place. In any case, it's something straight out of a horror movie, it's something the alien queen would have done in the movie Aliens. Uh, on a less creepy note, the big fin squid is an animal that's found a more conventional way of catching its prey, albeit not conventional among squids. But before I get into that, I want to say that the big fin squid is probably my new favorite marine animal. I'd never seen them or heard of them before I started doing research on this episode, and they're the coolest looking things I have ever seen. Uh, they have a massive fin on top of their head that steers them around, hence the name, and they have a characteristic pose where they'll hold out the upper part of their arms, and then the rest of the arm will just kind of dangle underneath. I imagine it looks kind of like a, a pinwheel or ceiling fan that has string attached to the bottom of it. They look kind of like the, the Martian tripods in War of the Worlds. I promise I'm not doing this description justice. You have to look it up when you get the chance. They are really, really cool-looking animals. Uh, they live way down there in the ocean, too, really deep, at about uh, 15,000 feet or 4,800 meters under the surface. And they've been found at depths of over 19,000 feet or 6,000 meters. Like other squids, uh, big fins have eight arms and then two tentacles. However, in other squids, those tentacles are much longer than the arms, and they're usually used for different purposes. The arms and the tentacles of a big fin squid, on the other hand, are virtually indistinguishable. Uh, they are the same length, and they both seem to serve the same purpose, which purpose is catching food. Uh, these appendages are covered with microscopic sticky suckers, and what the squid will do is use these appendages to cast a, a kind of net that allows it to snag prey that might bump into them. I saw one quote that described the big fin squid as a living spider web. It's also similar to how jellyfish catch their prey, just without the stinging cells and the venom. All ten of these appendages make up the majority of the squid's body length. The largest big fin squid ever found was approximately 21 feet long, and I believe 20 of that was just the tentacles and the arms. Uh, these appendages don't seem to have very much muscle in them, and it might be why the squid holds its arms out like it does to prevent them from getting tangled up with one another. Bioluminescence is another way that animals will search for and catch food at the bottom of the ocean. If you don't know what bioluminescence is, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a chemical reaction in an organism that allows it to produce its own light. It isn't exclusive to the deep sea. Uh, Glowworms and caves also use bioluminescence. Uh, but there are many, many animals in the deep ocean who use this evolutionary tool. And while finding food isn't the only way that it's used down there, there are many animals that will use bioluminescence to snag a meal. Uh, one example of this is the anglerfish. You've probably seen at least a picture of an anglerfish before. It's the one fish in Finding Nemo that they, they face off against when they go down into that trench. This bulb is lit by bioluminescent bacteria, and its purpose is to lure food towards the anglerfish's mouth. Uh, there are also animals that will shine light on their prey in order to see it better. For example, some species of fish, such as dragonfish, will shine red light on prey when hunting their food. Uh, red light is invisible to most creatures in the deep because it's the first color 
that's absorbed at depth. So most animals in the deep sea don't have the ability to see it anymore. These fish evidently can, and from what I understand, they use red light almost like a, an invisible flashlight, or maybe like a, a sniper scoping out their victim, and the prey doesn't even know what's coming. I think I've rambled on for quite a while now. Let's, uh, let's take a quick break, and we will be back right after this. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back as we continue our discussion about life in the deep sea. It's a absolutely fascinating topic, one filled with mystery. Uh, we've talked a little bit about how some of the animals down in the deep sea catch their food, uh, but bioluminescence, more than just for catching food, can be used for the opposite purpose as well. Some animals down there will use bioluminescence to avoid predators and avoid becoming prey. Some animals employ what's called a burglar alarm, when they're being attacked by a predator, what they'll do is they'll use their light to attract even larger predators that might chase away whatever's attacking them. Uh, some animals, like the firefly squid, use bioluminescent light as camouflage. What they'll do is, is they use it to blend in with the sunlight above. This is known as counter-illumination. And then one species of worm called the green bomber worm has bioluminescent fluid in sacs behind its head. And when a predator comes along, it'll release this fluid as little green bombs. And these bombs will burst and distract its enemy while it makes its, makes its getaway. Uh, bioluminescence is also a solution to another problem that life faces in the deep sea, the impenetrable wall of darkness. For many animals, this darkness is actually more helpful than harmful. It's the perfect place for prey to hide from predators. But when animals are searching for food or looking for a mate, some kind of sensory information is necessary, and bioluminescence is often the solution. Even this light, though, can be really difficult to see in the vast open ocean, so many animals have evolved huge light-sensitive eyes that can pick up even the smallest glimmers. Uh, the barrel eye fish is an example of this. It's a really weird example, too, because it's easily the most bizarre-looking animal I think I've ever seen. For the most part, they look like normal fish, but their heads are transparent, and their eyes, they're these two bright green orbs, and they face upwards from inside the head. Their eyes are inside their head. When I first saw a picture of it, I, I couldn't quite register what I was seeing. Uh, apparently, they face upwards so that they can see prey that might be swimming overhead, but they can point them forward if they need to. It's a really strange-looking animal. And other animals have evolved these, these really light-sensitive eyes, but other animals have also evolved in the opposite direction and are almost or completely blind. So instead of relying on their sight, they'll rely on other enhanced senses to make their way around and to find food and find mates. Now as you get deeper and deeper into the ocean, another problem animals face is the water pressure. The accumulated weight of all that water is a prevalent issue, to say the least. Uh, water pressure generally crushes any pocket of air, including those inside of an animal, such as lungs or air bladders. And what's more, it can also distort cells, proteins, and molecules in the body that are vital for life, which is, which is deadly. To deal with this problem, many deep-sea creatures have high levels of certain chemicals that will prevent this distortion from happening, including one called TMAO. What they found is that the deeper an animal lives, the more TMAO it's likely to have in its cells. TMAO also happens to be the chemical responsible for that fishy smell that we all hate so much. So if you think the fish you eat now are bad, imagine catching a fish that lives 10,000 feet under the ocean surface. Uh, some animals will also deal with the high water pressure with pressure-resistant structures within their cells, but it doesn't seem like this is very well understood. Now, so far we've talked mostly about life that lives in the open ocean. The ocean floor, which is also known as the benthic zone, has its own variety of habitats and its own variety of life. And while most, if not all, of the adaptations that we've talked about so far also apply to deep-sea bottom dwellers, these animals face their own unique challenges associated with their own environment, and thus have adapted in ways that animals in the open ocean have not. Uh, most of the seafloor is made up of what's called the abyssal plain. It's mostly flat, it's cold, it's dark, and it's very deep. Most of the animals living here are smaller. This is because the only food available comes from the relatively little marine snow that's still left. Sometimes the carcasses of larger animals living near the surface will fall to the ocean floor. And when this happens, these bottom dwellers, they, uh, they'll make the most of it. 
For example, a dead whale will attract life from all around when it reaches the bottom of the ocean, and for years, years afterwards, it can be a source of food as well as a home for these animals. Nothing is wasted, even the bones are consumed. Apparently, the majority of whale bone is composed of fat, and there are certain worm and snail species living at the bottom of the ocean that have adapted to burrow into the bones and feed on the bone marrow inside. But while the abyssal plain makes up 70% of the ocean floor, it isn't the only habitat that's found at the bottom of the ocean. In some places, you'll find deep-sea coral reefs with starfish, sharks, and all sorts of other life forms. Along the walls of deep sea canyons and sea mounts, which are just underwater mountains, uh, you'll find worms, mollusks, fish, and even at hydrothermal vents, you'll find thriving ecosystems. Hydrothermal vents are kind of like underwater geysers. They're vents at the ocean floor that spew out seawater that's been heated by magma underneath the Earth's crust. And this water will dissolve and mix toxic chemicals and minerals before it, it reaches the crust. It can reach temperatures of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit or 400 degrees Celsius. And it's probably the last place on Earth that you'd expect to find life. And yet, these places are hotbeds of life, no, no pun intended, because they are hotbeds of nutrients. Again, no pun intended. Uh, certain microbes living at the bottom of the ocean have adapted to process these toxic minerals into energy using a process called chemosynthesis. They've also formed symbiotic relationships with animals such as two worms, clams, and mussels, allowing them to receive the energy that they need to survive. Speaking of deadly environments that should be able to support life, uh, brine lakes at the bottom of the ocean also provide food for bottom dwellers. Uh, these are literal lakes at the bottom of the ocean. They're made up of water that is saltier and denser than the seawater surrounding it. So instead of mixing, it pools and it forms a distinct body of water on the ocean floor. Uh, the difference is so definitive even that you can, you can see waves forming on the surface of these lakes. These lakes are toxic. Uh, animals that fall in often don't come back out, but that doesn't stop animals from feeding on bacteria that lives on the edges of these lakes. Uh, before we finish up, before we wrap up, there's one last evolutionary tactic I want to bring up, or at least a trend among deep sea creatures that isn't fully understood. It's called deep sea gigantism, and basically what it is is that it's been noticed that there are many animals living deep in the ocean, mostly invertebrates, that will often grow to be much larger than their relatives living in shallower waters. Uh, giant and colossal squid are an example of this. Uh, spider crabs are another example. A full-grown spider crab can be 12 and a half feet wide from claw to claw, which makes them by far the largest crustaceans on Earth. Uh, giant isopods are another example. Imagine just a, a gigantic roly-poly. Uh, scientists aren't entirely sure why these animals grow to be so big. There are a few ideas. A few theories have been proposed. For example, it might be because larger animals are more efficient and have stronger metabolisms, allowing them to survive on less food. It might be because they lose less body heat in colder environments, and it might just be the isolation of their environment and the lack of natural predators that they have. In any case, it's a really cool fact that I think adds to the aura of the deep sea and its mystery. Well, that concludes our discussion about the deep sea and the incredible animal life down there. Once again, it's important to note that we still know very little about life deep in the sea, uh, very little about these animals, their ecosystems, their environments, and the lives that they live. But as more information is gathered and new animals are discovered, it continues to push the boundaries of what we believe life is capable of. The animals in the deep sea are truly incredible. Although if some of the facts I've shared today make you want to stay as far away from the ocean as possible, I can't say I don't understand. Thank you so much for hopping on today and listening to another episode of the Zoologist Podcast. Uh, I was having my mind repeatedly blown as I was doing the research for today's episode. So if you'd like to learn even more about the deep sea and the animals that call it home, go ahead and check out the research links, which will be in the description or in the show notes on my website, which is at thezoologist.net. If there's an animal you are dying to learn more about, go ahead and send me an email at the.zoologist.podcast at gmail.com. You can also reach me through social media. The Zoologist is on Facebook and Twitter and will soon be on Instagram and YouTube as well, so keep an eye out for that soon. 
Hope you all have a wonderful week, and as always, have a wild day.